starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Technology Leadership in the Customer Experience Era. Our speakers are Forrester Research Principal Analyst, Megan Burns, and Boxeos, Manager of Digital Strategies, Alex Katsuka. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few minor details. We'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. At the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a question section. If you'll just, we encourage you to put your questions there. So if you'll do that, we'll, we'll cover that at the end. And also we'll be recording today's webinar. An archived version will be available after the event at blogs.boxeo.com. So with that, I'd like to introduce Megan Burns, Principal Analyst for Forrester Research. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon or potentially this morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I am going to be talking today about technology leadership in the customer experience era. And in particular, uh, organizing today's conversation around three questions that I am increasingly getting uh, from the clients that I work with at Forrester who are in technology positions. And for those of you who don't know me, I actually come from a technology background. My graduate education is in software engineering, my undergraduate in customer, uh, excuse me, in computer science, and I spent the first 10 years of my career in the technology space, although heavily involved in customer experience. So I come to this conversation with uh, both personal experience and a personal interest in helping the IT community really get on board with this trend of customer experience. So I'm going to start by answering uh, three questions, asking and answering three questions. The first is, why customer experience and why now? You know, we've known forever that customer experience and how you treat your customers is important, but why has it become particularly urgent and top of mind for firms today at the beginning of 2013? Then we'll talk specifically about what role does IT play? in the customer experience. And I think we all know that it is significant, but let's talk a little bit about exactly why that is and, and what it means. And then finally, how can IT leaders drive customer experience improvement? We often talk at Forrester about the fact that customer experience is an organizational competence, not a function. It's something that everyone needs to be involved in. And there are some particular activities that IT leaders can do to help move their organizations forward, regardless of kind of where you are on the maturity continuum. And so I hope to leave you with some very specific and actionable things uh, that you can take away as leaders in your technology organizations to help move towards the goals that your organization has set for customer experience. But before we get to that, let's start with our first question, which is why customer experience, why now? Some of you may have seen some research that Forrester published last year, which indicated that we believe the world has entered the age of the customer. And the age of the customer is really a term that we've given to describe the convergence of several phenomena that are going on at the same time. One is obviously the emergence of greater control in the minds of customers and the increasing choice and increasing information that they have. But as a result of that, the age of the the customer is really characterized by an era in which many of the traditional sources of competitive differentiation that companies have gone after and used so early on it was um, you know in the industrial era it was things like manufacturing capacity distribution channels at some point it became information now we're seeing increasingly in industries many of those things being quite easy to copy and so we find that companies are looking to customer experience as one of the few remaining if not the only remaining sustainable source of competitive differentiation because it is such a challenge to deliver a great customer experience consistently that it's difficult for other organizations to copy if you can get it right. 
And so we take a look every year at the quality of customer experience in this age of the customer. If, if this is a source of competitive differentiation, who is actually doing that? And in fact, just this morning, we released Forrester's Customer Experience Index for 2013, which is a benchmark of 154 firms across 14 industries. And we evaluate customer experience quality by asking customers, because their opinion is really the only one that matters, three questions. The first is, how effectively did the company meet your needs? That's part of a good customer experience. How easy were they to do business with? And how enjoyable were they to do business with to capture the emotional component? And unfortunately, what we continue to see, this is the sixth year in a row that we've released this benchmark, is that uh, most companies are still not great. So when we took the 154 companies who were rated in the index, a full 64% still earned scores that fall into the okay, poor, or very poor categories. So there is a lot of mediocrity and a lot of downright bad experiences out there. So when you combine this age of the customer where we have increased empowerment from customers, increased access to information, greater competition, with the reality that many companies are not doing particularly well, uh, we suddenly have a burning platform. We have have a sense of urgency that if this is one of the few ways you can differentiate, you need to remedy this situation if you're one of the companies that falls into these bottom three categories. Because it used to be that if a customer didn't have a great experience with you, they could tell their friends, they could tell their family, but now with all of these things and social media going on, suddenly their ability to tell other people about their bad experiences, as well as their ability to hear about other people's bad experiences is dramatically amplified. So the, the word of mouth implications of customer experience that have always been there have become quite urgent. But it's not just, interestingly, it's not just social media that is doing this. As part of the age of the customer, one of the things that we've seen is an increasing interest in customer experience issues in the business press and, in fact, the mainstream business media. I can tell you that at Forrester, being able to find organizations, media organizations that were writing stories about customer experience, even as soon as five years ago, I've been with Forrester for seven years now, uh, there weren't a lot of articles being written about it. There were a lot of marketing communications and strategy communications and things for those industries, but we didn't see articles about customer experience, and that has changed dramatically. This is just one of a myriad of articles that we saw last year um, you know, from the, the New York Daily News about Chrysler uh, moving away from more traditional customer service incentive programs and really focusing on customer experience. And I can point to article after article after article of uh, highlights of customer experience um, gaffes that companies have created, as well as companies really going after customer experience becoming news. Now, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg phenomenon going on here. The media is interested in these things in part because this is increasingly part of what it takes to succeed, but that is also the reality that customer experience translates into big dollars. In fact, when we take how companies score on that customer experience index and we model the relationship that those scores have to loyalty variables, such as likelihood to recommend, willingness to consider the company for another purchase, and likelihood to switch, there's an incredibly strong correlation across all 14 of the industries that we study. And every year we model the effect that that correlation has on revenue. So if your customer experience scores are below your industry average, what is the difference in revenue upside that you may be missing out on relative to the companies that are above your industry average? And across those industries, there's a range, but the smallest number in our model is $20 million. The highest number in our model is $1.5 billion. Now that is for uh, wireless and uh, the, the bottom number for 20 million is for retailers, and that's in part because we assumed a, a fairly small retailer, conservative estimate. The 1.5 billion number for wireless firms is in part because the largest wireless subscribers have on average about 75 million customers. So even a small difference in the revenue per customer over that large of a customer base can translate into a significant amount of dollars. But the bottom line is that these numbers are very real 
for any organization. And so if there's one thing that really sums up the, the why now equation, it's that, you know, customers are paying attention to this, the media is paying attention to this, it means real dollars, and it's one of the few remaining strongholds of competitive advantage. So it's no surprise that we're starting to see a dramatic increase in the percentage of companies who have customer experience as a key strategic priority, who have it as one of their key corporate uh, progress indicators, uh, and who are really working to excel at it. So if you're in an organization like that and you're in a technology leadership position, how does this affect you? What role do you play in the customer experience? Well, I'm not going to bore you with recounting the story of the role that technology plays in customer interactions because everybody knows that in virtually every industry we're moving from a world dominated by physical experiences to technology enabled digital experiences. Even in the store we have tremendous introduction of technology from POS systems to digital signage, you know, increasing technology pressures and integration over the phone and suddenly we've got this proliferation of channels with PCs and mobile and tablets and all of that. I don't have to tell you guys that because you live that every day. And increasingly, it's not just these channels in isolation, it's combinations of them. As people are on their mobile phone, on their laptop, or increasingly on the mobile phone in a store, looking up. So the, the permutation and the complexity of your world uh, and the role that technology plays just in the execution of a basic customer experience uh, is almost obvious. But it's actually bigger than that. Because the thing about your customer experience, and this is a follow-on to what I talked about earlier in terms of um, the customer experience being a competence and not a function, is that your customer experience is really the product of something we refer to as your customer experience ecosystem. And that's our label and our concept, our analogy, if you will, for the complex set of relationships among your company's employees, partners, and customers that determines the quality of all customer interactions. So much like a natural ecosystem, there is a ripple effect in actions, not only in the most obvious decisions that the technology organization makes, but in many others that don't appear connected to the customer experience. So as your customers are working through kind of the classic life cycle, we already have the reality that employees and partners are touching and influencing all of these various steps in the customer life cycle. But when we break down these two icons for employees and partners into the reality of all these groups, we suddenly see a massive explosion in the number of distinct functions and groups that are behind that. So we've got marketing and sales and even your security guards and tech vendors, your call centers, engineering, social media, HR decisions that the technology organization makes affects the employee experience of every single one of these groups which can in turn ripple up to customer experience in, in really unintended ways. Uh, for example, I was talking to a company where in their contact center their employees were dealing with a system that didn't allow them to look at all the information they needed to troubleshoot a customer problem on a single screen. So they had to open multiple screens, which doesn't seem like a huge problem except the decision that the part of the organization had made in terms of the computing capacity of the machines they were working on couldn't handle having that many windows open of that particular application and it would crash their systems. And so well-meaning folks who technically had access to all the information that they needed, needed to vamp on the phone with customers while they restarted the application to be able to get to that information. So the ecosystem uh, methodology is, or, or metaphor is really an appropriate one because there's a lot of unintended consequences, right? There's a lot of wing flapping by butterflies who don't necessarily realize the ripple effect that their actions are having on the customer experience. And I think in no place is that more true than in the IT organization. And unfortunately, we, we often, and I say we because I still feel you know, very much a, a part of that community, we often get blamed 
but uh, it's not necessarily our fault entirely, but it is our problem. And so then the question becomes, how can we be part of the solution? How can we drive customer experience improvement inside the company? One of the things that I think we need to do is shift our mindset as IT professionals about what it is we do. And so you will very often hear, and you may be familiar with Forrester CEO George Colony, talking about the desire to eliminate the phrase information technology. Because the technology we put into place and manage for our companies is really not driven by the information, at least it shouldn't be. So George, instead of talking about information technology, talks about business technology. And I think this is a really important distinction, and I think it's a really important uh, word change and nomenclature change for us to make because words matter. And so if we start to think about business technology, it doesn't mean we abandon the concepts that are critically important to IT success. It means that we consider them in the context of the business, which if we are becoming customer centric, become, means you know, considering them in the context of the customer. So it's not that risk or reliability suddenly becomes not important. It becomes a factor that needs to be traded off with other considerations that affect the customer experience. So what exactly does that look like in practice? You know, if you show up every day for work, how is this going to change your participation and leadership in this going to change what you do? Well, to give you some context for that, let me show you a typical journey that companies tend to walk through on this path to customer experience. When you first get started, the focus is primarily on improving today's customer experience. And for many companies, that's quite frankly as far as they will ever get. They will continue on the path of improving today's experience, you know, continuous optimization, and they'll go there. Your company, if they're going to be very successful at this, should deviate from this path at some point. You don't, you never stop trying to improve today's experience, but you start to realize that much like we talk about in software development, we can continue to fix bugs or we can work to prevent the defects from happening in the software in the first place. And that is the point at which organizations begin to talk about transforming the customer, uh, excuse me, transforming the organization and then sustaining that cultural change so that we prevent customer experience problems from happening in the first place. You know, we'll never get out of that bug fixing phase because we'll, we're not perfect, right? We'll always inject bugs. But what does this look like in practice? So in this first phase, improving today's experience, it is typically characterized by what we call the closed loop process, where you're gathering feedback from customers about their experiences, you're prioritizing those issues, and implementing changes. Classic customer feedback process. And IT is involved in this at every single step of the game. So the role that you play first of all, requires supporting those customer feedback platforms. You are going to be called upon, depending on what part of the technology organization you're in, to help the organization set these up, to integrate them with systems, CRM, um, you know, call center platforms, website platforms, and allow the company to have the capability to even understand and measure how our customers perceiving their interactions with us today. But that's really just the basis of the foundation because once you get that data, our research shows that there's a tremendous amount of root cause analysis. Much as we have in, in technology troubleshooting, we're often ferreting out defects that have you know, six, seven layers of root cause that we have to go through. And having the technology organization be part of the attempts to find those root causes is absolutely critical because much of the situation in today's world has been caused by a series of decisions, some made by IT, some made by the business, that have a pile of consequences that we may not have fully understood. So your knowledge of business process and technology and policy decisions and history, quite frankly, of how certain decisions were made and why is absolutely critical to the understanding of what the real problem is so that we don't just treat the symptoms, but we actually prevent things from happening again. Uh, I'll give you an example. At one point there was a technology issue at uh, a cable provider and it had to do with the installation process. And Legal had made a policy decision 
that technicians were not allowed to touch equipment owned by the client when doing an install of this additional equipment for various reasons. And so the issue with unsuccessful installs was not a technology issue, it was a legal issue. Um, and this, the, the solution was actually quite simple from a technology perspective. So it was a combination of technology understanding and leadership with legal and risk leadership coming together and saying, you know, what's the right policy to adequately protect us from risk because that is not unimportant, but also, you know, taking into account what's best for the customer and if we have the skills to solve this problem, how can we do it? Now, out of that root cause analysis process, there will be things to fix. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges I think we face is when we find these things, often they come up in a very opportunistic way, you know, our schedule is baked. How do we have the funding and the resources to address them? Well, I think the reality is you have to have some flexibility. You have to have budgets set aside for addressing these things that we can't anticipate at the beginning of the year. You know, we can't have a pure waterfall model where, you know, we set our plans at the beginning of the year and if anything new comes in, we can't adjust for it. And unfortunately, that's still the norm in many organizations. It's not how people would like it to work. But beginning to set aside a pool that says, we know we will have some things. We know IT will be a part of the uh, fix that needs to happen. We're going to set aside resources to act on those things. And then we'll figure out a way to appropriately prioritize those things as we go. But the last thing that you can do is change your core business processes. And that's, a, I think, a pretty um, uh, forceful recommendation. But the reality is that you don't want to spend the rest of your life playing a giant game of whack-a-mole with customer experience defects, which is to some extent what that find and fix process is. Um, it's expensive, it's reactive, and a lot of that $20 million to $1.5 billion is going to be spent when these things initially roll out. So if you want to recoup that money, you have to prevent them. And that comes at the transformation stage of this journey. And business technology is key to real lasting transformation. Um, not only because you have all of that data in place, but in part because so many organizations are really driven by their IT processes in terms of guiding uh, and putting constraints on the business processes that we need to think about that interplay and say how do we create an IT organization that is truly customer centric and allows our company to be customer centric. So when we look at the host of governance processes that need to change, uh, there's a great example and a great case study from Adobe. So Adobe realized that the side effect of some of the decisions that they had made uh, was actually, uh, from a technology perspective, and this is actually the example I was talking about earlier, I stole my own thunder a bit, um, with the internal systems that were crashing on call center agents. And so they recognized that there was a series of governing bodies that had made decisions for seemingly sane and logical reasons at the time, but they had never thought through the ripple effect and what that would mean for employees and for customers. So IT governance is one of several processes that need to change in order to make sure that we don't have that kind of unintended side effect. And it's not that we're going to stop doing annual planning or product development or IT project management. The way I think about it is that we need to find a way to infuse a customer lens into these processes. So that means pausing to ask questions like how will this technology change affect the customer experience? Now sometimes that obvious, that's obvious and sometimes it's not. But there are techniques for finding that out, one of which is the visual that you see on this slide. This is called a customer journey map. And it visually depicts the customer's process of interacting with the company. And there's another technique that we use called a customer experience ecosystem map where behind each of those customer interactions, we uncover the six degrees of separation. What people did the person talk to or interact with? What systems did they interact with? Who are the people that built those systems? If they talk to a call center agent, what systems was that person using? And who are all the people that influenced the design of that system? 
includes IT, includes legal, includes the business, includes all sorts of other people. But it's a visual way to help folks who may not be directly connected to customers on a day-to-day -day basis kind of map that six degrees of separation between their decision they're about to make and how that might ripple up to the customer. It includes changing the decision criteria that you use in your governance processes to say how do we balance business and customer needs. Because as I said, IT needs are very real. Uh, you know, everybody makes the decisions that they make with the best of intentions. But we've often been operating from an incomplete definition of risk or an incomplete definition of cost if we're not thinking about the cost and the risk of a bad customer experience. So we need to integrate those into our decision criteria, not only when we're deciding what projects to approve, but in our project management processes as we're deciding on, you know, should we descope a particular feature? What's that going to do to the experience? And what's the balance of time and cost effort? Those conversations need to be tied back to the customer experience. And then as you get into your acceptance test phasing, acceptance testing is very often about functional correctness. Um, you know, we used to talk about the difference between verification and validation. Verification is, did I build the thing as spec'd? Validation is, is the thing that's spec'd the right thing for the business? And we need to begin asking those questions. So not just functionally does it work, but does the experience that we've either proposed to build or have built meet our customer experience strategy? Does it fit the intended experience that we're trying to deliver? And does it meet our experience quality standards? And are we willing to pull the brake on a project? You know, we do that when necessary if it's not technically ready, if it's not functioning properly. But do we have the discipline as an organization to say, you know what, it's functioning properly, but the experience is not where we want it to be. We can't let it go out the door. Do we have the discipline to do that? So the visual here is of a pilot with a checklist, right? We have checklists for these criteria in our acceptance testing uh, and our launch testing processes. Have we integrated these kinds of questions into those checklists, and are we making the right set of trade-offs there? Now, one company that has done this and done this quite successfully is FedEx. Um, they have created something that they call the 360 research structure, which is meant to help project sponsors form exactly this type of an analysis. So it starts with a template in their project proposal that says describe the impact to the customer experience. Along with that, they created a methodology because this is going to be a new skill for people. So they've created a methodology that people can follow to say, how do you actually figure that out? They've provided artifacts like journey maps that are really helpful in enabling people to assess what those impacts might be and access to key customer research that they need to validate that analysis and make sure it's right. But they've also done some great things from a process perspective, like codifying the RACI charts for different moments of truth in the customer journey. So that if there are, if your ecosystem map shows that you have eight or nine different organizations that are involved in creating something that affects the customer, how do you make sure you've brought all of those people into the conversation when you're proposing a change. Because often, you know, we scramble at the last minute because somebody didn't realize that they ought to bring organization XYZ in. They weren't intentionally trying to leave them out. They didn't know what they didn't know. So they've said, how can we be proactive and prevent those kinds of things from happening? And then finally, they've worked with executives and leaders to say, how do we change our criteria for accepting projects? And how do we change our criteria for uh, launching things? to make sure that we're keeping the customer experience in mind as a key dimension of quality in addition to just technical quality. So all of these are some very tactical things that IT organizations and IT leaders can and, and frankly need to be a part of uh, as, this, as your company goes through this attempt to really excel at customer experience. So if I could leave you with a few uh, recommendations before I hand it back over to Voxeo. First is connect with the customer experience leaders in your organization. Chances are there are people in the business that have been tapped to drive this change forward. Find out who those people are. They would welcome being approached by you uh, because very often they feel like they're fighting an uphill battle. And the more um, support and the more participation they have from people across the organization, the better. 
And to make that conversation easier, you can educate yourself on customer experience principles. That is quite frankly a lot of what we do at Forrester and a lot of how our research is used. And part of the reason that we actually wrote a book, uh, it was launched in August of last year, called Outside In, The Power of Putting Customers at the Center of Your Business. Because we wanted to make the customer experience principles and research accessible to people for whom this wasn't necessarily a full-time career. Um, so the best of our research over the past 15 years that we've had this practice is really rolled up into that book, and it's a great place to start. When someone comes to you, participate in that root cause analysis. If they don't come to you, offer to be a part of it. You know, if you have an analytics organization or a market research organization that's studying some of this kind of data, say, you know, we'd love to have our people involved in the conversation to see if we can shed some light here. And dedicate resources to that as well as the customer experience fixes. Part of what your customer experience leaders are probably going to do is asking uh, you to you or people on your staff to be part of a steering committee, to be part of cross-functional teams to help take a look at what's going on in the customer experience, to participate in exercises to develop that journey map and say what does our customer's interaction actually look like? Look like you have incredibly valuable information about that, and so you know set some folks aside and time for those folks to um, be part of this effort and and your customer experience leaders will thank you for it and I think you'll find that your employees will get a lot out of it too. And as part of that, be willing to adapt your core business processes. Be willing to inject this customer lens. But a corollary to that is really to stick to it because this is different. It's new. It will lead us to make decisions and trade-offs that we haven't normally made. But there's a lot of talk about changing the culture of a company. And unfortunately, the culture doesn't change as a result of the easy decisions. It changes as a result of the difficult decisions. And our commitment to the importance of customer experience is tested when we suddenly have to make a decision that feels counterintuitive. When a company like Charles Schwab many, many years ago decided to eliminate fees, they gave up 24% of their revenue as a result of those fees because they trusted that the long-term benefits of a better customer experience as a result of no um, nuisance fees was going to pay off in the long run. That was an enormous leap of faith. But that one act demonstrated a commitment to this and the importance of this that has paid off for company after company and really reinforced the shift in values and said we mean it when we say we're going to be customer centric and sometimes that means sub-optimizing along one criteria that we're used to um, in order to um, have the long-term gain that we uh, hope to get and, and know we will get. So, you know, really sticking to it and taking that leap of faith yourself as a leader in the organization I think will uh, help you get evidence of the payoff, but I think it will also send an important message to employees as they look at what is their role in participating in this. Uh, it sends a really powerful message. So that is the end of the prepared content that I have, but uh, I will hand it over to Alex from here, and uh, I think we'll be back at the end for Q&A. everyone. I'm Alex Keksuka and I'm the manager of digital strategies for Boxeo. I'm going to take you through a little bit about how companies have used Boxeo's platform to improve and streamline their customer experience. And as Megan has extensively illustrated, the customer experience matters now more than ever. But with new technology and with customers going mobile and going social, it's also become more complex than ever too. And it's become clear that voice solutions, IVR, and contact center implementations aren't enough on their own to let your customer service solutions achieve their full potential. At most organizations, fortunately, there's now buy-in at all levels for improving the customer experience, and that leaves the last remaining hurdle of wrangling all those complex channels into a cohesive solution. And there's danger inherent in not addressing those concerns. With a study by right now showing that 89% of customers reported they've switched service providers over a less than satisfactory experience, and some of the numbers that Megan just showed us about companies that still aren't delivering that top-notch customer experience, it's obvious the status quo is no longer enough. But how do you get from where you are now to where your customers are today or where your customers will be in the future? You don't want to expend five times the effort and you don't want to spend five times the cost and you definitely don't want to end up delivering five unique experiences over five very siloed channels. 
At Voxeo, our platform addresses these challenges head on, and we provide an easy way to adopt additional channels at your own pace, making incremental investments and minimizing any risk to your core customer experience. With our platform, once you've designed an application once, you can then easily deploy it on any channel. And this lets you provide a consistent customer experience, not just on voice, but on mobile web and applications, SMS, or even over social channels. We've removed complexity at every level of application development and deployment. We've got options that let you reduce your hardware investment by deploying in the Voxeo cloud. We build on open standards that allow your existing development team to use their existing skill sets. We integrate to your backend systems to ensure a consistent experience across all of your customer service channels. We provide security solutions like ANI verification and voice biometrics that can operate transparently to your customer and offer additional security. And our unified solutions can reduce your application maintenance burden and provide comprehensive cross-channel reporting. The overall result, you've got a lower total cost of ownership and an improved customer experience and you've delivered a consistent user interface across all channels and the ability to drive personalized interactions to easily create actionable reports and integrate with all of your common business intelligence tools. For an example of how it's worked out in practice, T-Mobile had the goal of delivering self-service across a range of phone channels, IVR, SMS, mobile web, and leveraging each to deliver a unified customer experience. At Voxeo, we gave them the ability to centrally design their application and to deploy it across channels with one set of reports, one backend integration, and one step configuration and updating of all channels. They not only achieved their goal of delivering a cross-channel experience, but they also saw no additional IT costs and overall a $300 million savings during a six-year period. At Voxeo, we're very proud of the highest ratings that we've received from Gartner and Ovum and how our platforms and solutions can deliver multi-channel solutions and easy design once deploy anywhere application architectures. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit us at Voxeo.com, connect with us on Twitter at Voxeo, or you can email me, alex at Voxeo.com. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. Great, thank you Alex and Megan. And it looks like we had a couple questions come through. Uh, Megan, we'll start with you. Uh, the first question is, what do we do if our organization doesn't have anyone leading the customer experience at an enterprise level? Yeah, um, that's a great question. You may not. Uh, and in fact, you know, we've seen a real rise in sort of VPs of customer experience or chief customer officers, but you, but you may not have one. Uh, I can point to many, many examples where the genesis of that position actually came from the IT organization. So there's no reason um, that you can't begin to make the case for this. So using the information that we've shared with you here today is, you know, other things you're you're getting in terms of, you know, in the call center and support and other things like that helping to create the sense of urgency and going to the leadership and saying, you know, we need to really be thinking about this. I think ultimately it's something that needs to live independent of any particular function just from a, a change management perspective, but even beginning to ask these questions for yourselves and change the business process and push back on the business to say, have you thought about what this will do to the customer experience? You know, you'd like us to make this change, well, you know, what is it going to do for customers? It begins to raise awareness and raise consciousness of this at the same time that you can be making a more explicit case to the executive leadership about the need to have somebody really focus on this. So I, I'm a big fan of lead by example and uh, begin to take on that mantra and then um, eventually make the case for why it makes sense to have someone who's more dedicated to this. And you may, based on your personal interest, you may want to move into that role. We've had a number of organizations where it's been the CIO or a, a, a high-ranking technology leader who has moved into the role of chief customer officer. And so it's, you know, it's a potentially a new career path, but one that a lot of very customer-centric IT professionals often find uh, incredibly rewarding. So think about it. Wonderful. And Alex, we have a question for you. Uh, when you talk about using SMS for customer service, are you referring to live agents responding to texts? Well, having live agents respond to texts is always a channel that you can deploy, but one option that we do a lot at Voxeo is customers will look for ways to automate certain interactions that are possible to do through SMS. You may have, for example, a bank 
may want to set up an automated SMS dialogue that lets customers conduct transfers or balance inquiries, or they may be able to, if you're a retailer, you may be able to check package shipping status. And there's also a number of options with SMS for implementing outbound notifications. So a doctor's office or someone else may wish to send appointment reminders. There's a lot that you can do with the channel that, that's automated. Okay, and we have one more question, and either Alex or Megan, either of you can take this. If you're using SMS and social, won't there be a need for more resources to manage these channels live, like with an agent, for example? Potentially there can be. Um, you know, often when we look at customer experience projects, there's a myth that better customer experience is inherently more expensive. Often it's not. Often there are things you can do to redeploy resources or have different resources focusing on different things. So when you start to take care of some of the you know, repetitive problems and you free resources up from dealing with one kind of an issue that's you know, not super high value, it can free people up to do other things like this. And in many cases it does result in you know, if you want somebody to have monitoring uh, of social feeds live, um, yeah, the, you know, that often is uh, new resources, but that can be balanced out with savings in other areas, and, and it's really becoming a consumer expectation. You know, you used to be if you tweeted something or you were, um, you know, posting something on Facebook, it was a shock if somebody from the company actually found it and responded. Um, increasingly, people are expecting that to happen, and they're turning to these channels as a place where they can um, make a complaint or raise a customer experience issue, and they're expecting an answer. So. Um, you know, again, in the age of the customer, expectations are shifting, and um, it, it may be an investment you have to make. And the question is, how can you stop doing some other things that are just, you know, um, not things we want to be doing anyway? I, I don't want to say stop doing stupid things, but sometimes they seem stupid to customers, um, and focus your time on something more high value like this. Great. And Megan, we have one more question for you, and then we'll wrap it up. As an organization, to create a template or a scorecard, find out where customers are, and to provide technology solution, what pointers should be considered? Um, can you repeat that? I'm yeah, sure. There. As an organization, to create a template or a scorecard, find out where customers are, and to provide a technology solution, what pointers should be considered? Okay, uh, and that's where I got confused. To me, the <laughs> templates and scorecards are, are two different things. Um, so let me address both. In terms of a scorecard, what we need to do is we need to begin measuring how customers perceive their interactions with a company. That is how we define customer experience at Forrester. And so the first thing that we have to do to define quality is to say what is the criteria that our clients use, our customers use to judge, hey, that was a great experience, or wow, that was a bad experience. There's a, a con an unconscious mental checklist they're going through in their head. We need to develop a measurement system and a scorecard that assesses how our customers perceiving us along those dimensions. Um, the pyramid I showed you earlier of meets needs, easy and enjoyable. Those are three great places to start. They're pretty much universal quality criteria. Now, you know, how easy is easy? What does easy look like when it comes to the phone versus the internet versus a store? You know, there's a framework that needs to be developed there and it, it's different for every industry. I mean, brands set expectations. What you expect from Apple is very, very different than what you would expect from Dell simply as a result of their brand um, and, and the expectations that sets for an experience. So companies have to kind of find the right criteria based on their customer research. But then you can take a look at adding to that scorecard, what are the operational events in our organization that form those perceptions? So this is where metrics like time on hold number of times they were transferred. Um, I have a great example from the, uh, an airline, Delta sent me a survey about a, a flight that had a five hour delay. They didn't bother asking me if that five hour delay was a good experience or not, they kind of knew that. But they asked me how promptly, you know, what, how satisfied were you with how promptly you were notified of the delay. That's a combination of when did they send the text message and when did I get it. So my perception of prompt combined with their operational data about when things actually went out helps you find those tipping points. So that's the scorecard piece that says how do we begin to know where customers are today and what we need to address. The template piece on the other side of it 
uh, for projects is often more about uh, giving people a map of the experience, but then factoring in good journey maps include not only sort of the process map from the customer perspective, but at each of those nodes a summary of those needs, wants, and expectations. So you know you can even think about using the journey map as a visual format for your dashboard. At this point, they expect this, and here's how they rate us, and are we delivering? Um, you know, so the the templates that you're creating for projects should be based on not only what's the change in the experience from a process perspective, but how is this going to move us closer to or potentially further from, and sometimes you do that in a conscious way and that's okay, um, our customer's definition of a good experience. So I think the, the most important thing to start with is what we refer to as a customer experience strategy which is not a roadmap of if we're going to do X, then Y, then Z. Your customer experience strategy is more a, um, a description of the experience you intend to deliver to customers. It's your definition of goodness from an experience perspective. And then both your template of how is this going to move us closer to goodness and your metrics should flow from that and be consistent. And that's really what gives you the system to help everybody in the organization rally toward that ultimate goal. Great. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Alex. Those were some great questions. Um, as we wrap it up here, I just wanted to remind you, if you have additional questions that we weren't able to get to, you can email Alex directly at alex at um, And as I previously mentioned in the beginning, this was recorded, so if you'd like to view the archived version, you can visit blogs at boxseo.com. We appreciate you all coming, and we hope to see you again at another Boxseo webinar.